Hello, welcome. Time again for our daily reflection. Uh, coming to the end uh, now of book three of the Psalms. Uh, we're up to Psalm 89. If you've not had a chance to read it yet, it's probably worth just pausing the video and have a read through. It's one of the longer Psalms, um, but it's a fabulous read. If you have had a chance to read through, um, you've uh, you've been treated, I think, haven't you? These are, these are really wonderful words. After the the darkness of Psalm 88, it's really beautiful to, to come into such rich language as we have it here in uh, Psalm 89. Um, uh, David, uh, uh, the, the throne of David and the covenant God made with uh, David is very much in, at the backbone of, of what's going on here. Uh, and there's a real uh, desperate concern in the psalmist, but he takes a long time to get there because his whole hope is rested in in who God is. Uh, so uh, briefly, verses, uh, and remember, it, as I sort of go through the structure, if you've um, got more detail, then, then that's f absolutely fine. Um, just skimming through some of the, the structure of the thing. Verses one to four uh, is a, a reminder that David's throne is to last forever because God made a covenant with him. Uh, 2 Samuel 7, it's one of the most important um sections in the old testament and it's because it has this this covenant promise where uh, a descendant of david will reign on david's throne forever and ever there will always be someone there uh, and uh, as you look at the the nation of israel you, you might wonder what on earth happened uh, but of course it's fulfilled in christ and he lives forever so all of that is in the background to, to this psalm it's a it's a fabulous fabulous psalm um the, the covenant that's made with David and all the, the confidence and security that comes from that actually comes from the throne that's above the throne. Uh, so uh, eyes lift, uh, verses 5 to 18, uh, uh, absolutely stunning, stunning language uh, about how how amazing God is. Verse 14, uh, draw in particular, righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Unfailing love and truth walk before you as attendants. Uh, there are four... Uh, astonishingly important Old Testament words there. I'll pick up on two, righteousness and justice. We, we looked at in uh, our stable meetings uh, and it's the, the idea of uh, doing right and putting right uh, and God is one who always does right and, and will put things right and, and, and that's the foundation of his very throne. Uh, fabulous, absolutely fabulous. Oh and the others then, unfailing love and truth um, that have this idea of uh, his his unfailing love is this uh, ongoing covenant love and truth, of course. Uh, these are the foundations of, of who he is. And so if God makes a promise to David for David's throne, then such a God will surely keep his promise. Uh, and so the, the, it, you, they're a delight to read, aren't they? A delight to pray. If you're ever wondering what, you know, uh, what, what, can, I, what can I pray, um, you could do a lot worse than read verses 5 to 18. Uh, then 19 to 37, uh, God is the one who's then established David's line. And there's this celebration of how God has done that work. Um, and then then we come to verse 38, which is kind of the the, uh, the occasion, excuse me, the occasion uh, on which this has uh, been written. Uh, and there's a disaster, isn't there? Uh, it's not entirely clear what that disaster is as you look at the um, the the, the specific words but it does rather look like the fall of Jerusalem it's the end of David's line as it would seem uh, we saw it recently in Jeremiah that everything just seemed to kind of come to an end with those final kings of uh, uh, Jehoiakim and um, Zedekiah and, uh, and the exile these promises to David that there'd be someone reigning over his people forever they, they seem to have come to an end so that's the, the occasion that, that seems to be behind uh, what we're looking at here. So all these promises from God, well, how have they come true? And then verses 46 to 51, you know, how, how long is all this going to go on? It, it, Lord, where is your unfailing love? You know, these, these things that we had expected. So uh, again, this is the tension of faith, not unbelief. This is a, a psalm that's rooted in, a, in an understanding of who God is 
And it's precisely because the psalmist has such confidence in God that he's bewildered when he looks around him. And I can't make sense of what I'm seeing. That That's the sense of what's going on. Uh, and before we come to it, uh, just um, right at the end there, verse 52. Praise the Lord forever, amen and amen. You know how the psalms are split into books 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5. Um, the Hebrew text doesn't have any kind of sense of of you know book one book two but it doesn't say that but at the end of each book you have this amen and amen phrase so verse 52 uh, not really part of the original psalm it's been added by the the compilers of the psalms remember that the psalms date uh, over a thousand years from from the earliest to the latest um, if you think of david writing some uh, moses uh, name is against one uh, and Psalm 137 by the rivers of Babylon. This is uh, after the exile. So that there's there's a huge time span. So somebody uh, after the exile collated them into what we now know as the Book of Psalms. Uh, and um, perhaps books one to five were, were written on separate scrolls. Uh, who knows? Uh, but certainly at the end of each book, there is this Amen and Amen uh, phrase. Um, Praise the Lord forever. Amen and Amen. So that's what that's about. Right. Um, what you could do now is, is what's really helpful to do is read the psalm again, as long as it is, um, or just, just skim over if you think it's too long. Um, but look at verses 38 to 45, that, that disaster section where things seem to have gone wrong. Read that as the crucifixion of Christ. So Jesus is the Messiah. He's the son of David. Um he was clearly shown to be that. Uh, uh, Peter recognised Jesus as the Messiah. Uh, people were crying out to uh, have mercy on me, uh, son of David, and those sort of things. Uh, he was. There was such hope being invested in Jesus that the promises of verses all the way from 1 to 37, it's all coming true again. That here is the king, here is the Messiah, this is great news. And it all came crashing down. So if you read verses 38 to 45 as... As, as the end of the Messiah promise again at the cross. Um, then it seems to be the end of hope, doesn't it? But of course the answer to this psalm and that whole situation is that Christ is risen. Yes, he died. It seemed to be the end of things. But it wasn't. That was the very, his very victory. It's what he came to do. And so Jesus is now risen and he's glorified and worshipped and adored. And the language of, of these earlier verses is applied to him in all his glory and wonder. And the holy ones and the, the angels, uh, countless numbers of angels, fall before him and worship him. Uh, so he is the answer. And yet we still look at our situation. Um, and we might well still have verses 46 to 51 in our minds. How, how long? How long? But we look at our own society that the Lord's name is held in contempt. Um, all sorts of things are structurally working against his people. And, in, and with, there are still terrible things happening around the world with whole Christian villages being wiped out and, and all sorts of things in our own country. Um, there is, even in our own area, a harvest field that seems ripe for harvest, particularly with the coronavirus situation. People longing for, for meaning and hope and... Um, recognising that normal isn't so good after all. This harvest field seems so ready, doesn't it? And so we might say, Lord, how long? How long before we see people turning to you? Please, please. How long will there be lost, needy people still lost, still in need? We call for grace, don't we? We call for the Lord himself to, to work. Still, the answer is the risen Jesus. He is the one who works through his people to call lost people to himself. So how do we respond? How do we respond? Uh, well, certainly we want to praise the God of Psalm 89. We want to join in with this wonder and praise and, and simply read the verses as prayer. A beautiful, fabulous thing to do. We praise him for his majesty, his power, his righteousness, his justice. Praise the Saviour who sits on David's throne today and will do forever. Jesus the same yesterday, today and forever. And then we cry out, Lord, how long? 
how long before we see your name honoured and people transformed by the power of the gospel, by the work of the risen, risen Saviour. There is a Saviour. Lord, how long before you apply that salvation to the lost people of Wirral? We're going to pray. Um, that's the end of, of, of book four, uh, uh, book three of the Psalms. We've looked through book four as well. Uh, the next few days, we're going to think about um, uh, going forward. Um, uh, our daily reflections will shortly be coming to an end. Uh, so what we're going to do is think about how we, we move forward with these, um, with your own uh, daily reflections, your own quiet time. So some, some kind of specific uh, nitty gritty type things over the next few days. Uh, and then we'll see where we go after that. All right. Let's pray. Our great God and Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for a psalm like this that teaches us something of your wonder and glory and who you are and reminds us even teaches us how to pray how to lift up our, our thoughts and how to know that you are the God who keeps his covenant you keep your promises astonishing Lord that you even make such promises how gracious you are to sinful people like us we thank you that uh, your promise to David has come true in your son uh, and even in the death of the Lord Jesus, the, there would have been some who thought that all hope had gone. And yet in that astonishing moment, that event, you you changed history forever. You changed the course of human history when you raised your son from the dead, the first fruits from among the dead. We thank you then that he is the answer to this psalm, that there is hope. And yet we still cry out. We still ask, Lord, how long? How long before your name uh, is no longer dishonoured to the extent that it is in our country, in our area? How long before we see the lost people of Wirral? Uh, uh, lost in their confusion and hopelessness and uh, dragged in all sorts of different directions by the culture around us. Lord, how long before they turn to you, the, the one true living hope? And so we pray, have mercy. And we pray that the name of the Lord Jesus will be lifted up, that you would grow your church, that at the end of this coronavirus period, we might actually see uh, many people looking back, giving thanks for coming to, say, that the, coming to salvation uh, in this time. So we thank you for these psalms and our daily reflections. What a gracious God you are that we can come to you in such uh, wonder uh, and beauty. We praise your holy name. We praise your righteousness. We praise your majestic, powerful, righteous throne. Honour your own name in our time. Amen. <laughs>